guys. Thanks for joining. And now we're recording, so it's official. So uh, thank you. I'm the executive director of the German Texan and Heritage Society based in Austin. Uh, we're very excited to have this speaker series on Zoom. We did have a speaker series in person uh, prior to COVID. So we did this about four times a year. And we during COVID, we actually did this online as well. Fine. So, and again, if everybody can just mute themselves, that'd be fantastic. So move forward, don't want to have to mute you. Uh, but GTHS, uh, we're based in Austin. We own the third oldest building in Austin, which was called the German Free School. Uh, we still utilize it as a free school. Um, we just, the past week had Oktoberfest where we had 1,200 people, top 20 kegs. We're, we're moving and grooving when that comes to that perspective. Uh, we also have an upcoming Christmas market, which will attract about 2,500 people uh, to our event. So not only do we do speaker series and heritage groups, we also do festivals, uh, genealogy, language program for adults and kids. Uh, we have our own German international school for pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade students. Uh, so we're very active and supportive of the German Texan culture along in, in addition with the German uh, relays on, uh, relationships with the German government. We just, in the past year, have had four delegations over from Germany. We had the foreign minister come to our location about three months ago, uh, three weeks ago, which was a big deal. She was the first person in 33 years to come to Texas, and she came straight to our place right off the plane. So uh, a big deal for us to have that honor for her to come and visit us before she went and spoke to the governor. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and I hope we can do these again in the future. I'm sure we will. And uh, yeah, thank you. I'll turn it over to back to Barbara. Okay, thank you very much, Christopher. Um, again, uh, welcome. My name is Barbara Bertold. Um, I'm uh, located in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. I'm a board member of the German Texan Heritage Society and also um, on the faculty at UT Arlington. Um, and our department is one of the co-sponsors. I also would like to um, thank our uh, other co-sponsor, um, which is the Dallas Goethe Center located in um, in Dallas. And as Christopher said, we are taking a beloved GTHS program online to make it more accessible and allow interested people from around the state and beyond to join us tonight. Um, and that's very excited. Um, uh, that's very exciting to me. And our plan is to host um, one lecture in the fall and another one um, in the spring. And each series will have um, a topic that kind of like serves as an umbrella for the whole um, for the whole year. And the topics will um, concern the contributions of German immigrants to Texas um, that they made in the arts and letters, education, politics, religions, the sciences, um, etc. And the theme for this year will be the impact of the 48ers uh, on state and national politics in comm commemoration of the 175th anniversary of the 1848 review revolution that took place in the area that's now known as um, Germany. And I'm very happy to have um, a recognized expert in the field here tonight. And so I want to take a couple more minutes of your time and introduce our speaker uh, to you. Dr. Thomas Alter is a historian of the United States and Texas who specializes in transnational approaches to race, labor, capitalism, and protest movements. He has published several articles on labor history and the related radical movement in the US, including an award-winning dissertation. Currently, Dr. Alta is working on a project that traces the rise of Texas as an international political and economic power from the 1890s to 1920s, and another project on the early 1980s Austin punk scene. He teaches at Texas State um, University, uh, and there his classes focus on the US, Texas, labor and working class movements. Um, as you uh, might know by now, he's a historian by training. And today, Dr. Alter will speak on Toward a Cooperative Commonwealth, the legacy of German 48ers, 
within Texas agrarian radicalism. So please help me welcome um, Dr. Thomas Alter, and I'm excited to learn from him. Thank you all for um, having me here tonight. Um, as it was just said, I will be discussing how German political exiles from the failed 1848 German Revolution, referred to as Ochtenfierzigers or 48ers, influenced politics in Texas from their arrival in the late 1840s through the early 20th century, but mainly focusing on this 19th century period. Um, let me, I've got some slides here, so let me pull up my screen. Okay, here we go. So after the defeat of the Napoleonic armies in 1815, um, all the old autocratic monarchies in of Europe began reasserting with an increasingly authoritarian manner their rule over the peoples of Europe. And by the late 1840s, many democratically minded Europeans had had enough. And what we know now is in Germany, revolutionaries called for the unification of all German lands into a single country with legislative assemblies and democratic rights, such as freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Let me see. Let me get. Oh, here we go. Now, in March of 1848, the first revolutionary barricades in Germany went up in Braslau. This is the capital of the eastern Prussian province of Silesia. This barricades went up in Braslau even before Berlin. And Silesia is where the revolution would be the most radical and based more among the laboring classes of peasants and workers. Silesia has a long history of peasant revolts going back to the 1790s, including the 1844 Silesian Weavers Revolt that provided a young Karl Marx and Frederick Engels with an example of the working class in action and its revolutionary potential. And this revolt is alluded to in the Communist Manifesto published just as the 1848 revolutions in Europe began. And Silesia is also where many of the Germans who would immigrate to Texas came from. Silesia was also a borderlands area and the Silesian arrivals to Texas also included Czechs and Poles. In Silesia, while the economy was based in agriculture, it was also one of the most industrialized Prussian provinces with an emerging textile industry. During the 1848 revolution, Silesia witnessed a unique convergence of farmer and labor demands, and Silesia was the only region in Germany to witness the creation of a province-wide organization, the Rustic Alliance, um, in English, the Rustic Alliance, that represented the interest of workers and farmers. And a similar convergence would appear in Texas upon the arrival of German 48ers. The impetus to start the Silesian Rustic Alliance came from the democratic club of the urban town Lignitz, the Lignitz Democratic Club was led in part by future Texan Otto Knurth. While many German radicals felt that a unified Germany should be a constitutional monarchy, Knurth called for a socialist republic run in the interest of the laboring classes. Knurth would marry into the Meitzen family, who would also immigrate to Texas. The Meitzens are the main focus of my research, as through three generations of their family, one can trace the evolution and continuity of agrarian radicalism in Texas, beginning with the arrival of 48ers to the agitation for the abolition of slavery, loyalty to the Union during the Civil War, and the line of independent working class parties in Texas from the Greenback Labor Party, the Farmers Alliance, the Knights of Labor, the Populist Movement, and eventually the Socialist Party in Texas. Now, the 1848 German Revolution ultimately fails due to the misleadership of middle-class forces in the National Assemblies based in Frankfurt and Berlin who hesitated to take power. This hesitation gave the Prussian monarchy time to regroup 
and unleash a brutal counter-revolution in 1849. With the ongoing counter-revolution, many revolutionaries fled Prussia and other German lands, some going to other European countries, most going to the United States, including Texas. By 1850, 30,000 Germans were in Texas, making up 20% of the white population. And Germans would be the largest immigrant, immigrant group in Texas and the United States until around 1900. Now, many Germans held romanticized, romanticized images of the United States as a land of political and religious freedoms. Conditions in Texas seemed well suited for German 48ers, and they hoped that the relative isolation of Texas at the time would allow them to form enlightened farming communities where they could keep their German language and culture alive. But missing in this idealized vision of Texas was the reality of slavery. Before the arrival of 48ers, Texas had seen a small but significant migration of Germans to Texas. From 1844 to 1846, a German immigration society made up of German nobles facilitated the immigration of around 7,380 Germans to Texas with the hope of establishing markets for German goods, for, for German goods, this market that kind of have a outlet for German goods in the U.S. Southwest and Mexico. And these immigrants are largely responsible for the founding of New Braunfels and Fredericksburg. Among the immigrants that came during this early wave were German intellectuals who fled German lands before the revolution, seeking, seeking to rid themselves of German absolutism. Among those who arrived in Texas during this period was Edgar von Westphalen. This is Karl Marx's brother-in-law, and he was a communist himself, as well as the Darmstadter group, this Darmstadter group was a group of roughly 40 individuals who set out to establish a communistic colony in Texas, Darmstadt's in the southern Hesse. Darmstadt's actually were most of my German ancestors are from, but they were not part of this um, communistic um, colony in Texas. Now, Edgar von Westphalen, he eventually returns to Berlin but not before attempting to get his brother-in-law, Karl Marx, to immigrate to Texas. As we know, Karl Marx did not come to Texas, but stayed in Europe. I always think that'd be kind of an interesting piece of like historical speculative fiction of like Karl Marx coming to Texas and what would happen. Now, the Darmstadter colony also did not last long. You have a bunch of idealistic young men out in the woods reading poetry and getting drunk can only last so long. Though some of them would go on to make individual civic, cultural, and political contributions to Texas, such as Jacob Crutchler, who was the land commissioner of Texas during Reconstruction when radical Republicans were in charge of the Texas government. Now, when German 48ers arrived in Texas, many had intentions of settling in New Braunfels and Fredericksburg. However, a cholera outbreak in late 1849 and early 1850 stopped many of these immigrants that arrived in Galveston and they're on their way to Fredericksburg and New Braunfels. They, they hear about the cholera outbreak and they stop. And so many 48ers settled in the counties of Fayette, Lavaca, Colorado, Washington, and Austin, in addition to the cities of San Antonio and Galveston. Now, upon arriving in Texas, these German 48ers did not cease being political people. After all, they had just participated in a revolution. Little did they probably realize how quickly they would need to draw on their political experiences as the United States at the time was embroiled in a heated fight over slavery. One of the main contributions of German 48ers, not only in Texas, but across the country, was how they politicized movements. When previously movements such as the abolition of slavery were based more on moral appeals and explicitly rejected politics and political organization. For example, the well-known abolitionist um, William Lloyd Garrison, 
and completely rejected politics. He saw the U.S. Constitution as a pact with the devil for allowing slavery to occur. And so they completely did not organize themselves politically. And this is what German Texans and German Americans, these 48ers, contributed to U.S. political culture. Now, in 1853, the National Bund der Freier Manner, or the League of Free Men, which sought to coordinate the political activities of German Americans nationally, called for state conventions to be held in states with large German populations. From December of 1853, to September of 1854, state conventions were held in Milwaukee, Louisville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Wheeling, West Virginia, and San Antonio. The San Antonio Convention of Germans took place in May of 1854, and they ad adopted a wide-ranging political platform. The platform began, quote, we are convinced that the people of the United States do not enjoy the liberties guaranteed to them by the Constitution. We are satisfied that the existing parties have neither the will nor the power to improve the political, social, and religious relations of the country, end quote. The preamble ended by making clear that the intentions of the convention was not to form a, quote, German party. The 1854 San Antonio Convention declared also that, quote, the soil should not be an article of speculation, end quote, and that everyone, citizen and non-citizens alike, should be granted free land. And a version of this would be passed in the 1862 Homestead Act during the Lincoln administration. The platform calling further for, quote, equality of labor and capital and all laws relating to them, end quote. And the convention adopted planks demanding the elimination of debtor prisons, greater protection of immigrants, and a progressive income and inheritance taxes. Judicial reforms included the abolition of the grand jury system and a simplification of the legal system in order to eliminate the need for lawyers. Uh, lawyers have worked with them, <laughs> so they kind of have their own legal ease, their own legal speak, that once you understand it, it's, things are usually pretty simple. And so there, here they are, these German immigrants calling for um, a simplification of the legal system so everyone can understand it. Moreover, the platform contended that, quote, it is the duty of the state to provide for the education of the youth, so the early advocates for public education. And the convention delegates demanded free schools and the, quote, establishment of universities with admission to all, end quote. Now, these demands were not entirely unique. You had other political conventions across the United States had, had such demands, yet this was the first time such demands emanated from a political gathering in Texas. And the San Antonio platform reached beyond a German language audience. A statewide newspaper printed the platform in English. And the political demands laid out by German Texans in San Antonio in 1854 would reverberate in Texas in the decades to come. Now, although the San Antonio platform encompassed a wide range of economic and social issues, it was the plank on slavery that produced a firestorm. The plank said, quote, slavery is an evil, the abolition of which is a requirement of democratic principles, end quote. Pro-slavery and other conservative advocates immediately questioned the loyalty of German Texans wondering aloud if they were abolitionist or even revolutionary socialist. And for some German Texans, the answer was yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the rancor over the convention and the accusations of abolitionism hurled against German Texans might have died down if not for the continued agitation of Adolf Dewey, a 48er and one of the main organizers of the San Antonio Convention. Undaunted and actually emboldened by the controversy, DeWay's newspaper, the San Antonio Zeitung, became an openly abolitionist newspaper. 
and DeWay also created a Spanish language newspaper to enlist ethnic Mexicans to the cause. The San Antonio Convention sparked a nativist anti-immigrant movement in Texas, in addition to threats on DeWay's life. By the end of 1855, DeWay had had enough. He sold his newspaper and moved to Boston, where he was active in the abolitionist movement, opened the nation's first kindergarten in 1859, and became one of the first advocates of Marxist socialism in the United States. And this is at a time when utopian socialism, um, the forming of model communities, kind of most famously Robert Owen's New Harmony, Indiana, was the dominant form of socialism, as opposed to Marxism, which sees class struggle and a working class revolution as the main way to um, bring about socialism, as opposed to this utopian socialism is like, we'll build this perfect community and then this will be an example for everyone else to follow. Now, for Germans back in Texas, things only got worse as the state moved towards succession and civil war. The middle to the late 1850s was a time of frequent planned slave revolts. In a study of slave insurrections in Texas, the historian Wendell Addington wrote, quote, Frequent white support to slave revolts in Texas seems to have come from local farmers and artisans, the poor whites who were also oppressed by the slaveocracy. Special mention should be made of the Germans in Texas, almost none of whom held slaves and who were themselves refugees from Prussian tyranny, end quote. Now, as we know, the move to the Civil War was unstoppable. Though counties with German majorities voted overwhelmingly against secession. In Fayette County, where Otto Knurth, remember this is the leader of the Lignitz Democratic Club and the Meitzens in Fayette County, where they lived, the vote for secession was defeated by a count of 580 for secession and 682 against. This was despite Fayette County being one of the largest co cotton producing and slave holding counties. The county's newly arrived German, Czech, and other immigrants proved to be the deciding factor. The state's rights Democrat in Fayette County, well, you can tell from the title of the paper where its sympathies lied, blamed the anti-succession vote in Fayette County on, quote, sauerkraut dirt eaters, end quote. Now, the war years were difficult for most Germans, and they were referred to these years as der Hangerzeit, or their hanging times, due to acts of violence carried out against them. German immigrants in the hill country organized Union Loyal Leagues, and a bushwhacker war, or a guerrilla warfare, enveloped the area of the hill country during the war. Now, at the end of the Civil War, German Texans sought once again to exert themselves on the political field. At the same time, so did former Confederate elites. Now, at the end of the war, many Texans hoped to start anew through the cash crop of cotton. The question now stood, though, who would control the cotton wealth? Under capitalism, the primary way to extract profit is through the control of labor. With slavery gone, economic elites needed new forms of labor control. Many poor white people were left landless from the economic collapse of the South during the Civil War. This was in addition to freed slaves who never received their 40 acres and a mule. Many poor Black and white people hoped to climb the agricultural ladder from sharecropping to tenant farming to land ownership. Sharecropping is when you don't own the land and you're paying your rent from a share of your crop. So they're kind of hoping to go from sharecropping to then actually paying rent and then to land ownership. Now, economic elites within the Democratic Party, however, moved to institutionalize tenant farming and the law to their benefit. In 1873, 
with former Confederate Democrats taking control of the state legislature, the Landlord and Tenant Bill was introduced in the state legislature. The Landlord and Tenant Bill was a clear piece of class-based legislation designed to control the state's agricultural workforce and to codify into law the crop lien system to the benefit of wealthy agricultural elites. The law stipulated for all persons um, renting or leasing land that it proposed putting a lien not only on the tenant's crop, but on all of the tenant's personal property as well. If the tenant was unable to pay, the landlord under the bill was allowed to seize with the help of a local sheriff, not only the tenant's crop, but also the tenant's personal property with the tenant having no legal recourse. Opposition to this bill, much of it led by German Texans, would be the spark for working class, working class based radicalism in Texas that would last until the 1920s. With the introduction of this landlord and tenant bill, many farmers who had supported the Democratic Party began to raise the question of creating a new farmers based party. At this divisive moment, a group of German Texans, including now old 48ers, organized a convention in LaGrange in early October 1873 that brought together disgruntled German Democrats and Republicans. The end result of the convention would be the formation of an independent working class based People's Party to oppose the landlord and tenant bill and as well as calling for free public education. This is nearly 20 years earlier than the more famous People's Party that was associated with the populist movement. The LaGrange Convention adopted a resolution stating, we are perfectly satisfied and aware that both present political parties have outlived themselves and their sole objective is to keep up their organization in order to keep the power in the hands of the successful party for the sake of office seekers and holders. Therefore, we deem it necessary to cut ourselves loose from all party organizations to bring the politic body, body in a healthy condition again, which we think can only be done by a new party organization, which must be built up gradually and is bound to cut itself of all party organizations. I think that first paragraph can res resonate with many people today. Now, the resolution also included, quote, opposition to moneyed capitalists who form powerful corporations and who form coalitions by an undue influence on the legislature at the expense of the mass of the people, end quote. So this is in Fayette County and Germans in Bastrop County adopted similar resolutions. Now, Fayette and Bastrop County Germans were not alone in their move to political independence from Democrats and Republicans. They were joined by area Anglos as well. Foremost among the Anglos joining the independence movement was Captain Jesse Billingsley. This person has been largely lost to history during the question and answer. If someone, I'd be impressed if someone actually knew who this person was. Billingsy is credited by the folklorist J. Frank Doby as being the first one to cry, Remember the Alamo, remember Goliad at the Battle of San Jacinto. And so here it is Remember the Alamo, one of the most probably famous phrases. Yeah, I'd even argue in like world history, but ask someone the name who was the first person to say it. Unlikely they would know it was Jesse Billingsley, even though it's Dobie has done the research and found out it was him. He was a highly respected veteran of the Texas Revolution and a participant in the Battle of San Jacinto. Billingsley announced his break from the Democratic Party due to the landlord and tenant bill, and as well as government subsidies to railroad corporations and his support of free public education. Billy Billingsley was nominated as this People's Party candidate for state representative, 
And for his defection, this once lionized hero was berated as a, quote, Benedict Arnold and a, quote, tool for the radicals. Um, being a tool for the radicals had racial connotations as radical Republicans just the previous year had been removed from office. And these radical Republicans, which included German and African-Americans, had calls for racial equality. So a vote against the Democratic Party was seen as a vote against the white race and for its, quote, mongrelization. At this time, Black political clubs were also being created. Now, this iteration of the People's Party failed to stop the Landlord and Tenant Act, and tenant and sharecropping were institutionalized in Texas. And Billingsley, due to his alliance with these radical German Texans, was largely erased from history. Now, a few years later, the Greenback Labor Party would enter Texas. The Greenback Labor Party was a national merger of the Greenback Party with its calls for putting more greenback currency into circulation and the Socialist Labor Party, led in part by former Texan Adolf DeWay, the guy who I mentioned earlier who started the San Antonio Zeitung, and the Socialist Labor Party had demands for labor rights. So you see a merging of these two organizations. From the political agitation of German Texans in Fayette and Bastrop counties, the Greenback Labor Party, through a black and white interracial coalition, elected a Greenback Labor Party candidate to the U.S. House of Representatives in the district stretching from Bastrop to Galveston. This was an area with a large German population. Now, by this time, many of the 48ers had to had or were about to pass away, and a second generation of German Texans was coming into its own. Most significantly was E.O. Meitzen, Edward Otto Meitzen, son of 48er Otto Meitzen and nephew of Otto Knurth. Now, as the problem of land tenancy was only increasing due to the policies of the Democratic Party, Meitzen became one of the founders of the People's Party of Texas in 1891. This is a political cartoon actually making fun of the founding of the Greenback, I'm sorry, of the, the People's Populist Party in 1891. It's, it's, a, it's kind of hard to read right here, but it's a platform of lunacy, and it's a bunch of hot air lifting the party up, which is a coalition of a number of organizations, the Knights of Labor, the Farmers Alliance, Greenback Party, the Grange, and Prohibition, Prohibition Party, um, amongst others. Now, the People's Party was more than a party. It was an interracial movement of workers and farmers with demands to nationalize the railroads, the end of convict labor, the secret ballot. This is before when you voted, you had to get a ballot that was often you could tell who someone was voting for. Um, so they wanted a secret ballot, um, also calling for the direct election of senators, the eight hour workday and union rights, among other working class based demands. And the populist movement came the closest thing to breaking the two party system in the United States, but it was stopped by voter fraud, violent repression, and the creation of Jim Crow legal segregation. This is when Jim Crow came about as kind of a historical misunderstanding that the Jim Crow came about at the end of Reconstruction. Now, there was a strict racial etiquette that had to be followed, but it wasn't law like Jim Crow. And Jim Crow was specifically designed to prevent uh, further unity between poor black and white people. So you see the legal segregation and restrictive voting requirements to prevent any future interracial alliances over their shared economic and political demands. Though the populist movement was defeated, the problem of tenancy, tenant farm tenancy remained with 52% of Texas farmers tenants by 1910. And among black farmers, the tenancy rate was as high as 80%. Many Texas farmers then came to doubt the system of capitalism itself. E.O. Meitzen, now joined by his sons and other second and third generation German Texans, along with many Mexican-Americans, joined the growing Socialist Party. 
with the Texas Socialist Party becoming the second largest statewide organization of the Socialist Party behind only number one, Oklahoma. Um, the Texas Socialist Party called for many of the same demands of agrarian radicals going back to the 1840s. This time, not as reforms of the capitalist system, but to replace it with the socialist system designed to put the working class in power over a society based on human needs rather than profit. The Texas Socialist Party was also more international in its activism, supporting the Mexican Revolution, opposing U.S. intervention in Mexico, and U.S. involvement in World War I. This is a picture from the New Era print shop in Hallettsville, Texas, which is south of the Grange. And the rebel, started by the Meitzens, became the third largest socialist newspaper in the country. So here, little old Hallettsville had the third largest socialist newspaper in the entire United States. Um, and here's a picture of Eugene Debs here at the top, the, the bald guy, with um, Texas and Oklahoma socialists. And the bearded um, gentleman in the middle is E.O. Meitzen. The Socialist Party, through its activism, made land reform and women's suffrage, women getting the vote, major issue in, major issues in Texas politics when before the main issue had been prohibition. As we know, U.S. involvement in World War I not only brought about a repression of working class radicalism, but a repression of German American culture as well. Now, all too often, Third parties, such as the People's and Socialist Party, are judged by their electoral success. If you look at their electoral success, it's, it's not a success. They usually fail miserably, and the vote counts. But I would argue this is not an entirely accurate measurement. A more accurate measurement would be whether or not the reforms they advocated were achieved. And we should appreciate the contributions of German Texans and German Americans who helped politicize economic, political, and social movements in the United States, helping to abolish slavery, and contributed to Americans gaining land reform, the eight-hour day, the secret ballot, the progressive income tax, workplace safety regulations, and union rights. All the while, these German immigrants and their descendants pushed America to live up to its ideals of democracy of, and an egalitarian society. So thank you. And little self-promotion. This is my book that has so much of this history in it. So thank you. Absolutely. Take a picture, of people in the room, <laughs> so you remember it. <laughs> Or a screenshot. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to stop sharing. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Tom, for your um, fascinating presentation. I will open up the floor for uh, questions, and you may uh, raise your hand. So, and I will try to see everybody. And you can also use the chat. We all will be kind of monitoring the chat also. Give time to digest it all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There is a message coming in the chat. Yeah. Okay, from um I'll just use first names if that's okay. That's how we are at GTH. <laughs> so from Abigail, um, Abigail is asking, what were some of the problems that arose in your research regarding using uh, primary resources? Good question. This took me quite a few years <laughs> and, and quite a bit of travel. Um, especially I'm a labor historian by trade, and most working class people don't leave behind archives and leave behind printed materials. Like you can go and you can get presidential papers and or senators or different very wealthy individuals. And so this involved just a lot of piecing together um, different sources from 
all over Texas and also going to North Dakota. The Mitesons went to North Dakota for a little bit after the Texas Socialist Party was repressed and going over to um, Silesia. It's now Western Poland, um, primarily, and Berlin, where it wasn't so much the archives that I ran, <laughs> found the information, but running into uh, um, old German, East German historian, um, Walter Schmidt, who had been doing some of this research as well. So we spent a, a nice day at his um, East German, uh, his East Berlin apartment, kind of going over this. But fortunately with the Meitzens, they had the newspaper. And so that that's a record right there. And all the issues of the rebel have been um, preserved and actually available um, digitally through what wasn't when I started, it was still on microfilm, <laughs> but now you can access it through. Um, oh boy. It's, if you just like Google historic Texas newspapers, I think it's like a portal of Texas um, it has all kinds of newspapers, but it was a long process of just going to um, Lubbock at Texas tech where a lot of papers are stored and just small archives, just a lot of patience piecing it all together, so. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I see Ayana's hand up. If Hi. You un you unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, very well. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I think it's been the second time I, I heard you present on this. And I brought some of my students oh. who are now listening in. And hopefully they will be listening in once this is uploaded. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about those. And, and they're actually doing their research projects on, project. on Germans uh, in Texas. Uh, and some, you know, we've been discussing some counterfactual history. And I'm wondering what your take might be. Um, if the 48ers had just never made it to Texas, but stayed in the northern states, because why would they make it to Texas? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how might that have changed on that, the Texas German standing among those Anglo-Americans? How might that also have changed the political landscape? You know, you talk about Texas socialism, the formal labor radicalism, just a little, you know, intellectual game here. Yeah. So if 48ers hadn't come to Texas, what would be what would what would have happened in Texas? Is that what you're asking? Basically? Um, well, I think it, I think it really would have made Texas a much different place um, politically, even though we don't really think about like radical 48ers, many of them socialist as part of like the Texas political tradition. But I think a lot of that is now expressed in kind of this populist tradition in Texas, which um, kind of an anti-authoritarian and kind of more, more democracy and kind of a distrust of centralized authority, which I think now has been captured a little bit more by conservatives rather than left-leaning people. I mean, you kind of see this populist mm -hmm. rage among many like Trump supporters, even though I argue Trump is not a populist, but you do see a lot of that kind of populistic anger and angst over like kind of caused by a lot of economic anxiety, um, really strong in Texas. And I think that kind of goes back to some of these, what it's, what it started as kind of left political traditions have now become a little bit more of a right political tradition if that makes any sense and so i think maybe you wouldn't have that as much in texas and texas would have been very like similar to other southern states which don't have as much of this um kind of a agrarian radical tradition which it is there in other southern states it's going to be clear i'm not just speaking in absolutes right here but texas has this particular kind of populist um, radical tradition, which I think th these German Texans really kind of laid the groundwork for. So it's, did that answer it fully? Was there a second? Is that get? Is that good? <laughs> is that, I'm sorry if I answered it completely. There, there's no right answer. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, it's just speculative. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, there is one thing Thank that would you. have been yet yeah, for one thing I do speculate on that's not entirely related to this question is um, kind of outcomes of the Civil War where you had where you have the example of Missouri where you also had 48ers and there the 48ers um, rose up and seized St. Louis and its industrial capacity and then kept Missouri out of the Confederacy. And I think we could have had something similar like that happen in Texas if Sam Houston would have acted. But Sam Houston was like, no, no, I don't want blood spelt over just the old man keeping him in office. But if you had a similar thing, you could have had German Texans rise up in San Antonio, seize the arsenal there. You had a number of federal forts in West Texas and possibly could have kept Texas in out of the Confederacy. That's another piece of speculative <laughs> um, history. Thank you. Yes, Cheryl, please unmute yourself and just ask you. Yeah. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted you to comment on the, the influence of the German Texans from post-Civil War uh, through World War I on education. I mean, uh, my studies in, in uh, of the German Texans, uh, it always Im impacted me in a profound way how um, how important the leadership among notable German Texans was in education because as you said, the 48ers, they got older and they and they had to pass on their legacy and their political ideology to the next generation. but that that only can go so far without a firm education system and a broad reading and a broad exposure, uh, everything that the German Texans stood for was bound, in my opinion, was bound, you know, to be eclipsed. So what can you comment on that? Just... Yeah, I don't have specifics on just what specific like individual German Texans did and what their contributions to the education system in Texas. But as you saw from part of that 1854 platform, if you read the entire thing, it is very uh, large sections of it are focused on education mm -hmm. and the importance of education um, and also secular education. Mm -hmm. um, they're calling for ministers to not be allowed to be teachers when a lot of that's where a lot of the early like schoolhouses or mm -hmm. few, very few that were around, it was ministers. So they're calling for secular free public education all the way to the university level. I mean, here is an 1854 calling for universities and it's not so much a little bit later that you start seeing public universities but here's the germans early on advocating for that and in many of these um german settlements where kind of more the uh, anglo settlers come in one of the first public buildings they built is a church and these German settlements, the first building they built is a school. It was a school, <laughs> like so, the Vereinskirche in yeah. Fredericksburg. That exactly. was, first of all, a, a place to gather for the children for early education. I mean, we're talking the week they arrived. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was immediate. And 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 so that, that has always been a profound concept to me is the importance of the German Texans. Uh, on, on not only formal education, but at home education. And, and, and they shared that with the Scandinavians. They yes. shared that with the Czechs and the Vens and, the, and, and so many other ethnic groups. But, yeah. And I think that carried the day to a certain extent up to the Civil War. What do you think? I yeah, mean, I mean, the Civil War kind of puts everything to a <laughs> grinding halt when it comes to the German yeah, Texans. Yeah. But yeah, but they do reassert themselves. And like I said, I haven't followed this particular train. But if you look at just even like Texas State, I mean, not Texas universities in, in our state, they're arguably better than most of like the state public universities across the rest of the South. I mean, I'd say like University of Texas, I mean, Texas A&M, no, mm -hmm. they're they're really good i mean nationally yeah. recognized schools i mean compared to other southern universities which more known for their football teams not to they're all good they're good schools and not to me like getting on them though but i think i would say i mean that just you have those 
German immigrants with having a putting a real priority on education. And it was during Reconstruction when you had large numbers of German Texans were actually part of the state government before yeah, they were they, before then they were kicked out when Texas was redeemed. That's when a lot of the legislation was passed. Yeah, they, they started felt, creating uh, yeah. public. They felt uh, public passionately that education should be free, yes. and uh, and and it, it was in their DNA, and and they they actually helped make compulsory education happen. Uh, I mean, al I mean, not alone, but but definitely it was a movement, and and um, you know, uh, I've been a teacher all my life, and and I, I've I've always felt that you know if we don't if we don't carry our political ideology and our our belief in a separation of church and state, you know, into our schools and 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 make that such a strong part of what the Germans knew. They knew that when they got on the ship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we 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 with our religious fervor uh, kind of forgot the importance, even though it's written in our constitution. So yeah. that's a profound part of the German Texan heritage that I'd I'd like to see recognized a little bit more. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And incidentally, I'm a graduate of Texas State University. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I got a master's degree in German oh. uh, in 95. Oh, okay. Cool. From Texas State. So, and I've been in German. I'm I'm a past director of the German Texan Heritage Society. Oh. So I have a deep interest in, in the organization and its work. And nice. thank you. And oh. I've, I've been listening to every word that you've said. I'm sitting here listening, and uh, I'm working a a, a, a puzzle, um, and and while I was listening to you, here's the puzzle I'm doing. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Nice. <laughs> so it was really nice to, to hear you and to yeah and to keep my mind focused. I do puzzles too. <laughs> <laughs> Not why I was doing this talk though. I can't do that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank I'm gonna you I'm gonna click out. Thank you. Any other questions? Let me just quickly look at the chat or comments. Or speaker. <laughs> hey, Tom. Can yeah. I speak? Yes, my hand. Hey, hey, Tom, there is a direct line from 48ers through the progressive movement of the World War I era. But when you read the literature on it, they seem to have been forgotten. And it's overlooked. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. That was one of the frustrating things that I found. And then what I seeking to correct in my book because i mean that's how you're taught there's the the there's the progressive era there's this they all there's they're always taught as these separate things like there's the populist movement and then the socialist party and of course the socialist party has no connections whatsoever to the populist movement <laughs> they're always taught as these very separate chapters now i don't i mean there isn't i don't think there's necessarily like a i don't know what can to call it like a conspiracy or something out there but I think it's just part of like how this like overall portrayal of just like third parties and protest movements is just these um, Don Quixote esque things. Just oh, they're just tilting at um, windmills and you're just throwing your boat away if you support any of these movements. But when you connect them all, which they are connected. I mean, there's little like there's flesh and blood connections of actual people besides this kind of organizations and networks blending into each other is a solid what I term a farmer labor block that existed in U.S. political culture from the 1870s into the 1920s that was continuously advocating for working class and working farmers demands that I argue without this kind of continual agitation of this farmer labor block from the 1870s to the 1920s and seeing it as a continuous thing instead of just little separate things um i argue that it very much laid the groundwork and without the existence of this farmer labor block we might not have had the progressive era 
or New Deal eras, because it was these farmer labor activists and organizers who were the ones that were continually championing these various issues from women's suffrage, the direct election of senators, the, the original U.S. Constitution, it was the state legislatures that elected senators. And that was that was one of the demands of farmer labor advocates, the secret ballot, just being able to not have like a piece of paper that's kind of marked a particular way and having to go vote in front of your boss or landlord where they know who you're voting for, to be able to have the secret ballot. Yes, these things were not enacted by a Eugene Debs getting elected president, but it was, these things nevertheless were enacted, like old age pension, we have social security now, that's a demand going back to Thomas Paine of the American Revolution, he's mainly known for just writing common sense, but he had this whole like radical, um, which they called agrarian um, platform um, that was there, and so, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> I'm just saying, who, why, why has history been taught that way? Because this doesn't coincide with maybe what some more kind of political and economic elites would like, as opposed to more things originating from the working class. So uh, Yeah, well, that made it off into the culture wars. I'm just curious if erasure is a part of that, too, because the Socialist Party at that time was uh, didn't have the stigma that it does now. So as historians wrote history past that period is it possible that that played into that do you think yes yeah i mean yeah the cold war played into it um there's also for a long time there's a, a columbia university historian richard hofstetter and then um the 1950s in this book age of reform said that he's trying to trying to explain mccarthyism and um this the red scare that was going on then and he just blames it on just backward hayseeds. And he sees in the populist movement the kind of the origins of an incipient fascism in the United States. But if you look at the actual history, it's not that at all. And so it also has like some just kind of urban elite kind of like prejudices against country folk who also who were thinking and did things and had ideas. Um so there's multiple different kind of like prejudices like coming in, like prejudice against this rural folks by urban people, Cold War politics in it, class politics, racial politics, all kinds of things affect um, the writing of history. So don't just listen to me. Go listen to other, other historians too. <laughs> <laughs> We're, keep keep writing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have reached um, the top of the hour. Um, I would like to thank everybody for attending and I hope um, that you all had a good time and if so, plan to come again. Um, in the spring, our next session is planned for March uh, 21st and our speaker uh, will be Dr. Walter Kamphöfner, Professor of History at Texas A&M and his talk will uh, be on the 1848 revolution in Texas, the Black German Republican Reconstruction Era Alliance and progressive politics in Texas. So we are kind of staying true to the theme that we started for this year. Uh, I'd like to thank um, GGHS again for hosting uh, this lecture series, the Dallas Goethe Center for being a co-sponsor and Eddie Walsh for helping uh, coordinate the speaker uh, series. So thank you all and I hope I'll see you again next year.